Hello and welcome to video 12 in this DP600 exam preparation course. And we've made it. This is the final video in the study guide. We're going to be looking at querying data by using T-SQL. Now you'll notice that I've added an extra video there because I really wanted to give you one more video just to really help you prepare for the exam. So we'll be going through how to prepare for the exam, some other resources that I think you should take a look at before you take the exam and some advice for when you're actually sitting the exam as well. But we'll be going through that in the next video. For this video, we're going to be focusing on these three sections of the study guide. So we're going to be looking at querying the lake house and the data warehouse using T-SQL. And we're also going to be looking at the visual query editor, which is a feature of both of those two SQL endpoints as well. Finally, we'll be mentioning how to connect to and query data sets using the XMLA endpoint. As ever, I've released study notes to help you go a little bit deeper, just to make sure that you're covering off all the right points and links to other further resources if you want to go a bit deeper on whatever I've mentioned in this section of the study guide. As ever, I've also got five sample questions to test your knowledge at the end of this video. So let's just start by looking at the different ways that we can access the T-SQL engine within Fabric. And there's a few different ways to be aware of. So one of them is the Lakehouse T-SQL endpoint. Now, one thing to bear in mind here, as we've already mentioned quite a lot already, is that this is read only. So all you can really do here is select statements, DDL, that kind of thing. You can't do any sort of inserts, updates, deletes, all that kind of stuff from the T-SQL endpoint in the Lakehouse. Now, the more obvious place to do T-SQL is within the Fabric Data Warehouse. Here, you're going to have the opportunity to write T-SQL both DDL, DML, inserts, updates, deletes, select statements, all of that stuff. So the data warehouse is going to give you the ultimate flexibility really to write T-SQL scripts within Fabric. Now on top of the T-SQL query editor, you can actually also create T-SQL like queries using the visual query editor. And this is quite similar to the Dataflow Gen 2 if you've ever used the visual editor in a data flow. So we can do things like merging different tables and filtering tables and adding additional columns, that kind of thing. But we can do it through a no code visual interface. And we'll be taking a look at that in a bit more detail shortly. So the other option for writing SQL is via the XMLA endpoint. And as we've mentioned previously in this course, to connect to that XMLA endpoint. We need to go into our workspace settings, as you can see on the left here, grab the connection string, go into SSMS in this example, connect via the analysis services server type, pass in your XMLA endpoint in there. That's going to bring through all of our lake houses and our warehouses within that workspace. And then we can write different queries depending on your use case from that XMLA endpoint. So now that we have a good understanding of where we can write T-SQL, for most of this exam, you need to have a pretty good level of T-SQL, at least an appreciation for what a lot of different T-SQL functions do and be able to at least read T-SQL quite well. And I don't think there's kind of a definitive list of which T-SQL functions you need to be familiar with, but I definitely recommend being comfortable with the following. So the difference between where and having, group by, summarization, union and union all, different joins and when to use them, common table expressions, things like lead and lag, row number, partitioning, that kind of thing, subqueries and cross warehouse queries as well. So rather than just describing all of these things, I think it'd be better to jump into Fabric, open up a data warehouse and show you some of these functions in action. Okay, so here we are in SQL Server Management Studio. And I've connected to one of my gold data warehouses here called DW Gold using the SQL connection string. And you can see that currently we don't actually have any data in this data warehouse. The tables are empty. So the first thing that we're going to do is just to bring some data from some other tables that we've got into this data warehouse. So to do that, I'm just going to be using this CTAS. So create table as select. So it's going to enable us to create a new table in this data warehouse using existing data in another data warehouse. Or in this example, it's actually a lake house. So we're connecting to the SQL endpoint here. So this is an example of cross database querying, because what we're doing here is we're creating a table 
from another lake house altogether. So we're getting the all of the data from this dbo.revenue table in our lake house bronze, and we're creating a new table called dbo fact revenue. So then if we refresh these tables, we should now have the first one, which is dbo fact revenue, this one here. And we can do the same for dim date and dim branch. We're going to be using these data sets just to show some of the functions that you need to be familiar with for the exam. We're not going to cover all of them because to be honest, I'm not sure exactly the full breadth and depth of what is expected for the exam for T-SQL, but we're going to go over some common types of problems that you might see in the exam. So now if we refresh our tables again, so now we've got our DBO fact revenue, our dim dates and our dim branch. So let's just start by visualizing our data here. So specifically, I'm going to be looking at this fact revenue. And these data sets come from the same data set that we used actually in a different part of this exam preparation course. It's relating to car sales and car dealerships. So you can see in our fact revenue table, we've got a revenue figure and we've got a date ID column and a branch ID column here. And that's what we're going to be using for the rest of this analysis. So what I'm going to be doing is presenting you with a series of problems. And then we're going to walk through how you might solve that in SQL. We'll be starting off quite simple and then we'll be adding in more and more functionality as we go through. So what if we wanted to calculate the top five branches by total revenue? So to do that, we're going to be needing to perform some sort of aggregate. So this is what our fact table looks like currently. We've got branch ID and revenue. And what we want to be doing is calculating the top five branches. So what we could do is just select the top five here, branch IDs, some of the revenue. So what we're doing here is doing a simple group by on the branch ID because we're looking for the top five branches and we're going to order it by the sum of the revenue. So this is the aggregate calculation that we're running on this aggregate here. It's a sum of the revenue and we're ordering it by the sum of the revenue descending. So we're getting the top five. Now let's change the problem a little bit and maybe we want to return only the top five branches in Spain or maybe the top three branches. Now Spain is a country name that comes from a different table in our data set. So what we've added in this example is an inner join on dim branch. And we're joining on the branch ID because we have the branch ID in both data sets. We're using an inner join here because we only want to return data for which we have both keys. Again, we're aggregating by the sum of the revenue. This time we've actually brought through a few different columns from that branch dimension table. So let's just run it all and see what we get here. Okay, so this query has returned the top three. And what we've done is we've filtered this results for only country names that are equal to Spain. Now we've had to add in some new things into this group by selection because we've also got country name and branch name mentioned here. So we've also brought through the branch name so that we can just, you know, we've got more than the branch ID. Maybe you don't not familiar with the branch IDs. You want the actual branch names in this example. And we can see that that has brought through the top three branches that are in Spain by the total revenue. So that has sorted that problem. But what if we wanted to filter after the aggregate? So for example, give me all of the branches that have a revenue of greater than some amount. So here, we're not gonna be doing the where statement because we want to be using having. So when you want to be doing filtering after the aggregate or on that aggregate value, then we're gonna be wanting to use having and that's gonna come after our group by statement. So previously the where statement here, because we were kind of pre-filtering on this country name. Now we're looking for the results of an aggregation that are greater than, in this example, 5 million or 50 million. So we've got a very similar setup. We've removed the where statement because now we're not just interested in Spain. We want all the branches and we're going to use this having some of the revenue greater than 50 million. So here you can see it's returned only two branches, which makes sense. What if we change this having statement, we removed one of the zeros. Yeah, so here we're just looking at 5 million. So when we've got 50 million, there's only actually only two branches that have more than 50 million revenue over this time period or over the full data set in that fact table. Now in this example, we've been using the inner join because that's what we wanted for this specific use case. But for the exam, you're gonna be need to be familiar with left join, right join, inner join, full outer join, all of these different join types and when they are useful 
for different scenarios. Now, we're not going to be going through all of these here because there's quite a lot to go through, but I definitely recommend, you know, if you're not familiar with these things, learning the differences between these and when you might want to use one or the other. So another thing that you might need to be familiar with for the exam is common table expressions. Now, these are really heavily used in the world of SQL when you're creating views or things like that. So you need to be familiar with how you construct a common table expression, what the, the key words are, what the general structure is, and that kind of thing here. In general, the common table expression allows us to define kind of like variables that we can use later on in our script. So here, we've got these three lines of a query. We're selecting the top five branch IDs and summing the revenue. We're grouping by that branch ID, so it's similar to what we saw before. And so we can actually just select these three rows and have a look at what that returns us. And then what we're doing is we're kind of saving that in this variable or this common table expression called top five rev. And the syntax here is always gonna start with with, which is the keyword for a common table expression. You're gonna give it a name and then as open brackets, put in your expression within those brackets. And then we can use this top five rev later on in our query. Now, one of the other benefits of common table expressions is that we can create more than one of these. So for any subsequent expressions that we declare, firstly, we're gonna need a comma there, and then we can call a second one branches. So for subsequent ones, we don't need the with keyword, we only need that on the first one. And so here I've defined branches as select branch ID and branch name from DBO dim branch. So this is what this one looks like. So we're just getting the branch ID and the branch name and we're storing it as this branches. And then the final kind of section of a CTE is the select statement. So you're always going to need to return something from this common table expression. And we can do that with a select statement. So as we can see here, we're selecting the branch ID, the branch name and the total revenue. And these are coming from top five rev. So that's our keyword for our first expression that we defined up here. And we're joining it with our branches, which is our second one here. We're giving it these aliases. And to run this, we have to select all of the different sections and then press execute. And we get this result here. So we've got the top five branches by revenue. And then we've joined that on the last section of our CTE back to the branch data set. Now, obviously this could also be written in a different way. You probably don't especially need a CTE to return that result, but I just wanted to show you the structure of a common table expression because you might get asked about that in the exam, or you might get shown some code that is in this format and you need to understand how it works. Another thing that you might need to be aware of for the exam are the lag and the lead function. So, this is a way of creating new columns that reference other columns, but with some specified offset. So probably worthwhile just taking a look at a bit of an example here. So what I've done is I've defined another common table expression here. So in the first part, we're getting the top five branches and then we're dividing this revenue by one million just to give us you know, some a bit easier values to comprehend. And we're getting the floor of that division. So it's going to round down to single digits in this case. And we're defining that column as revenue in millions, just to make it easier to understand what's going on with this lag and lead function that we're going to introduce shortly. So this is what our data set looks like. We've got five branches and we've got rev, which are all single digit whole numbers now. So we've stored that as rev t. And next we're going to introduce a lag function over this data set. So we've got select branch ID and rev m which is looks like this and we're going to add on another column into this using this lag function so what the lag function is going to do if i just run this let's just start with an offset of one and we rerun this so the lag function is going to look at the column which you pass in which is revenue m and it's going to look at the value of the row number minus the offset so for row number one here it's going to look row zero, which doesn't exist. So that will return null. But for row two, it's going to look for the value in row one of the column that we pass into the function. Now, another thing that we've done here is we've ordered it by this rev m. So the order here has changed. It's now in ascending order from one, two, two, three, six, like so. And we can change this lag function to anything we want. So here we're doing it with a lag of two. 
So the offset parameter here is going to be two. So it's going to introduce another null because now we're offsetting by two and it looks like this. Now hand in hand with the lag function, we also have the lead function, which looks in the opposite direction really. So rather than looking at the lag, so looking back in time, the lead function is going to look forward in time or at least forward in your row index. So it's actually going to start on this row here. Now let's just change this back to a offset of one. So we have, and let's just change this to lead. So when we run the lead function here on the same column, revenue M with an offset of one, this is going to be the result here. So now our first value in this lead col column is actually going to be the value here. Similarly, this value is going to be here. This value is three, six, comes from here. And now we have an old value at the end of our data set because we don't have, you know, a sixth row from which to pull that data from. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that we can't do something like this. So we can't do a lead or a lag with an offset of minus one. The offset parameter cannot be a negative value. So bear that in mind. Now, another function to be aware of is the row number and partitioning. So row number, as the name suggests, basically runs through your data set and sequentially numbers your rows. Okay, so let's just run this first section of code just to have a look at what this is doing here. So here we've defined our row number and we've given it this name row num and we've also passed in a partition value. So what it's going to do is it's going to group all of our dealer IDs. So here you can see in the output here, all of these dealer IDs, so dealer ID DLR001, this first one, all of these values are within that partition, okay? They're all that same dealer ID. And the row number is gonna assign a row number based on the order, so the revenue. So these are all ordered in revenue ascending order. And then we're creating our row number one to eight within this partition. Then you'll notice for the next dealer ID, DLR002, now we've got 10 values within this partition ordered in the same way. And we've got row numbers defined here from one through 10. So that's this section within the CTE. What I've done is I've just selected star from parts, which is the name of our CTE. And I've just done a bit of a where statement just to only get two of the dealer IDs back. So here you can see this example here. We've got DLR001, which is this one. And we've got DLR0017, which is this one. So make sure you understand row numbering and partitioning and ordering by for the exam, because this is something that could easily come up. Now, the last section I wanted to mention, or the last topic that I wanted to cover is subqueries. So for all of the other examples within this tutorial or this video so far, we've been using select star from table, right? So if we go back up here, we've got select all of this stuff from DBO fact revenue. Now a subquery basically doesn't have that structure of select star from dbo.table. Instead, we can actually open up a brackets here and rather than doing a whole table or getting the data from the whole table, we can create a subquery that's going to basically pre-filter or do some sort of T-SQL query, return the results of that subquery back up to the top level here. And we've got to give it this alias of sub. It doesn't have to be sub, but that's just what I've called it here. And we'll see the results there. So what this is doing is first going to calculate this. So whatever is in our brackets, we're going to get the revenue figures just for these two dealer IDs. And then we're going to get select star from that result. So again, this is just a bit of a toy example, just to show you subqueries in a bit of action, or at least the structure of a subquery, just so that if you come across it in the exam, you know what that is. Okay, so here we are in a data warehouse and it's the same data warehouse that we were using for the first part of this video, the DW Gold. So we've got our fact revenue table, our dim date and dim branch in here. Now specifically, I want to show you the visual query editor. So we can access it by clicking on a new visual query. And immediately we're going to get this introduction here to build a visual query. You need to drag some tables onto our canvas here. So let's just drag on the fact revenue and we'll see what we get. So the visual query engine basically tries to make it as simple as possible to transform your data that is in your data warehouse or also in the lake house t-sql endpoint as well so we've got our fact revenue table so what can we actually do with it here well you can see along the top here we've got some kind of quick options for choosing specific columns removing columns that kind of thing filtering so removing certain rows sorting rows transforming we can do group buys 
We can also do merging and appending different data sets together. So if we want to drag another one of these onto the canvas as well, then we can kind of combine those using either merge or append. But we're not going to do that in this example. Now, another thing that you can do within the visual query engine is to click on this plus button here and we get access to a few more commands. So we've got all of the ones that are available in that top menu. Plus we've also got some transformation. So we can do some text transformations on a specific column. We can do length, finding the first characters, adding columns using, for example, a conditional column or column from examples. So if you're used to using the data flow Power Query engine, you can might be familiar with creating a new column from examples. And we can also do some adding column from text using these methods here. So say for example, maybe I want to do a group by on this fact revenue table, and I want to get the median value. I'm just gonna change this for the median, and I want it on the revenue column, and I want to group by our branches. So we also have this fuzzy grouping as well. So if this column is not particularly good quality, you might want to add in some fuzzy grouping, which is basically going to look at likeness or similarity between different values in that column. And if it's above a certain threshold, so they're very similar, so maybe there's just one character that's different, it's gonna add it into the same group. So that's what fuzzy grouping would be. We don't wanna enable that there because we've already managed our data quality. So if we do an okay here, you can see it's add in this step here. So now, Along the bottom, you can see the result has actually updated. So we've got this group by the branch ID and we've got our new column, which is the median value within that aggregate, basically. So say I wanted to, I'll just remove this one because we don't, don't want to be doing anything with our dim date. We've got our fat revenue now. And what we can do is either save as table. So this is going to save the results as a new table, or we can save it as a view. So you can see that this is actually grayed out here because it's you can't save this as a view because the query fact revenue is not supported as a warehouse view since it cannot be fully translated to SQL. And the reason for that is because we've used this median and median is not actually a function in T SQL. So what we can instead do is rather than grouping by and aggregating on that median value, we change this to sum. I expect that. Yeah. So now that error message or that warning message has now gone away. We might want to also change this to sum of the revenue and then we can save it as a SQL view. So maybe we want to do some of the revenue aggregation, give our view a name. It also gives you the SQL statement for that view, which we can copy to the clipboard if we want. And we just save it as a view, which you can query from a Power BI semantic model, obviously acknowledging the fact that with a view, it's going to fall back to direct query mode if you're using direct lake mode to access this data. So that was just a tour of the visual query engine in the data warehouse. I think for the exam, just understand what it's capable of. Have a look at the different functionality here. Understand what you can do here because you might get a question or two about the visual query engine. Okay, so let's just round up this video by looking at some practice questions that you could expect for this section of the exam. Question one, the following SQL scripts creates the results shown below. What is function in this example? So we're doing select branch ID, column one, and then your function, which you have to work out what that function is from sales, and we're returning that table below. So take a look at the answers on the right hand side, have a little think about what that function would be to produce the results in the table at the bottom of the page. Pause the video here, have a think, and then I'll reveal the answer to you shortly. So the answer here is A. We want to be using a lag function because we can see that what we're trying to do is make a transformation from column one to column two. And we can see the pattern there that on row three in column two, there's obviously an offset going on there. And we can see that the offset is two because row three in column two maps to row one in column one. And we know that it's going to be a lag function because column three is actually two rows behind what's on column one. And you can see that replicates below with rows four and five as well. And another clue here is that we've got two null values at the top. So if you've got null values at the top, it's gonna to be a lag function because it doesn't have a value for that row one in column two and row two in column two. So that one's always gonna be null. So we know that it's gotta be a lag function and we know that the offset is two. So it can't be B, which is a lead function, 
the lead function is going to look ahead of time rather than looking back in time. And the bottom two there have an offset of minus two. So the offset in a lag and a lead is always positive. So those two would not be correct either. Question two, you have the following query analyzing sales data for various products. Your goal is to analyze the sales data by product name and year, but only for the products that have a yearly sales amount of more than $50,000. How would you complete this query? So take a look at the different options there. Have a think about how you would come to that conclusion that this question is asking for and I'll reveal the answer to you shortly. So the answer here that we were looking for is B. So the question here is asking you to analyze sales data by product name and by year. So that is the first clue here. In our group by, we need to be grouping by the product name and the year not the product key and the date key, because that wouldn't be the right aggregation for what the question is asking here. Now, the second part of the question is we're asking for products that have a yearly sales amount of more than 50,000. So the yearly sales amount of more than 50,000, that's gonna come from our sum of the sales amount. And the sum of the sales amount is gonna be calculated during that aggregation. So we need to be using having here. What we're trying to do here is filter out the result of the aggregate. We're not filtering out before the aggregate because that would just filter out individual rows in this table. We want to be looking at the result of an aggregate function where the sum of the sales amount, not just individual sales amounts, the sum of the sales amount is more than $50,000. So the answer here is B. We need the group by product name and and year, and then having, we need to use the having statement to only return the product names with the yearly sales of more than 50,000. Question three, you're trying to inspect a join between two tables to spot referential integrity violations. Which of the following T-SQL join types would be easiest to identify keys on both sides of the join that do not have a match on the other side of the join? Is it A, left join, B, right join, C, inner join, D, full outer join, E, cross join. So the answer here is gonna be the full outer join. So again, there's two parts to this question, really. Firstly, we need to understand what a referential integrity violation is. So a referential integrity is when you're joining two tables together, obviously you're gonna be joining on a specific key. Now, a referential integrity violation would occur when one of the keys in the left-hand table is not in the right-hand data set and vice versa as well. So to be able to identify that using a SQL join, we're gonna be needing to use the full outer join because the full outer join is gonna bring back, firstly, the instances where those keys do match. And then secondly, all of the other results that don't match from both tables. So when we get this back, we're gonna bring back some null values where there isn't an appropriate join or is an appropriate match on that join for the table on the left and equally the same on the table on the right. So that's going to help us identify referential integrity violations by investigating where there are null values in that output. The left join and the right join, they're not going to help us here because we need to identify violations on both sides of that join. The inner join is only going to return the, the matching keys from both sides. And the cross join is just going to return us all the different combinations of the keys that exist in these tables. So that's not going to help us really identify referential integrity violations. Question four, you have two warehouses, warehouse one and warehouse two. You want to create a SQL view in warehouse two that combines data from both warehouses. Your solution should minimize development effort. Which solution do you recommend? Is it A, use a data pipeline copy activity to copy the table in warehouse one to warehouse two. B, create a shortcut from warehouse one to warehouse two to perform the query. C, use cross database querying between warehouse one and warehouse two. Or D, use a data flow gen two to read the table in warehouse one and set warehouse two as the destination. So the answer here is C, use cross database querying between warehouse one and warehouse two. Now within a warehouse, we can query any other warehouse within the same workspace. So this would be the most economical or require the least amount of effort because we can just query directly the data, the table, warehouse one from warehouse two. 
B would be incorrect, create a shortcut, because we can't actually shortcut from warehouse one to warehouse two, functionality doesn't exist at the moment. And the data pipeline copy activity and the data flow gen two wouldn't minimize the development effort. So that would technically meet the requirements apart from the requirement that says your solution should minimize development effort. And this is something that you might see on quite a few questions within the exam. So when you see that, it's a bit of a flag that you should always look for the most efficient way of doing things, or normally there's a method that requires little to no effort against some that require more development effort. So the answer here is C, using cross database query. Question five, you're using the T-SQL query editor and your goal is to add a new column to your data set called salary bins. And this column is going to bin a continuous salary variable into three different bins less than 30,000, between 30,000 and 60,000, and more than 60,000. Which functionality should you use to add this new column? A, add additional column. B, add column from examples from all columns. C, add column from examples from selection. D, duplicate the column. E, add column from text. So the answer here is A, add a conditional column. So when we're in the T-SQL visual query editor, there's a few different options there to help us add columns. And for this specific use case, creating a new column, which is going to bin the values in a specific column, we're going to be wanting to use the conditional column because that's where we can add in the logic for less than, less than or equal to, and more than. And we can add more than one conditions on that column, which would help us achieve our goal of creating these bins in this salary bins column. Now add columns from examples. So these two are functionality within the T-SQL visual editor, but it's gonna be very difficult to implement that logic from a columns from examples. You know, it's not really a good use case for that type of adding column functionality. And D, duplicating the column. Well, that's not gonna do much. That's just gonna duplicate the column. And similarly, E, adding a column from text, that's also not gonna achieve what we're looking for. So the answer here is A, adding a conditional column. We did it, congratulations. We made it to the end of the study guide. This is video 12 out of 12, and we've covered an awful lot of ground over the last six weeks. So well done for sticking with it. It's a very tough exam. We've covered a lot of different things. This exam covers a very wide range of topic from T-SQL, PySpark, DAX, all of the different planning and all of that sort of thing. So to get this far is a really good job. Now, as a bonus, I'll be recording one more video in this series, basically to help you prepare to take the exam. So things you need to know before the exam, when you're booking your exam, and whilst you're in the exam to try and help you get as good a score as possible. So thank you very much for joining us in this series. I'll see you in the next video, which will be the final video. I look forward to seeing you all there.